Because we had a number of questions on this point, which is just... Along uh, with MPs' expenses, is it not about time that the amount of holiday they receive reformed as well? <laughs> this, this Parliament sitting for less time than any Parliament for many years, a 12 weeks holiday. George Galloway, you're taking 12 weeks holiday. Is it a good thing? Some people think it was rather a good thing, I w Wouldn't it be better if this Parliament never came back? <laughs> <laughs> this, this, is a, this is a Parliament of poodles with pagers and follow the leader politics. And Ian Gibson was witch hunted because he was a man of independent mind. Because he opposed... <laughs> the, because he opposed Jeff Hoon's wars, Tony Blair's wars, because he exposed the new Labour uh, uh, apostasy at every turn. Now, a parliament like that, of autonom automatons, it would be better if they went on holiday and never came back. It would be even better if they called a general election now and let people elect a new parliament. That would be the best thing. I, uh, I noticed you mentioned it was unrealistic for MPs to spend a great deal of time on holiday away from their constituents. Uh, George, how was Big Brother? It was fine. It was mainly during the, the Christmas New Year uh, recess. I don't know if you uh, fully grasped that point. That's the holiday. But, uh, but, uh, uh, it's called the holiday. It's called the holiday. Yeah. Now, most of us, uh, for, uh, there's a rare uh, outbreak of consensus on this point, will definitely not be on holiday for 12 weeks or 13 weeks. I'm in my constituency every day, and even when I'm on holiday, I will be in it at weekends, mainly because I'm coming back to do a radio show every Friday and Saturday night from 10 o'clock at night. Yeah, 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 we do with that commercial. <laughs> the man there in the picture, then we go on to another question. Yeah. It's just following on from what's already been said, it's all very well for uh, Mr Galloway to say that 12 weeks is too long, but you only have to look at his attendance in the House of Commons to see that he's never there I anyway. Know, I'm in the House of Commons every day, you see, you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> but I seldom wish to vote for either Jeff Hoon's motion or David Cameron's amendment. But I'm in the House of Commons every day, so I know there's some young new Labourites seated through the audience with a view of uh, making these points, but you're just wrong. I'm in my constituency every day, I'm in the House of Commons every day. You're looking at the man who was in the House of Commons on Christmas Day, and I believe, believe me, I was the only one there. Mm. Very odd day to go to the House Indeed. of Commons. Indeed. That's, that's, that, that, that's, that's, that's what the police it's said. <laughs> <laughs> He, he, were, was ha he was handing out <laughs> gifts. <laughs> Patricia Field. How, how concerned should I be that non-medically trained staff are advising me about swine flu? This is this new thing. OK. Mm. George, Gall George Galloway. Well, I'm more concerned. Do you think it's been hyped up, do you think, this whole yeah, thing? Yeah, I'm happened? more concerned about the medically unqualified hysteria which is being drummed up in the media about it. That's why the, the website is, uh, is frozen. That's why the helpline is uh, overwhelmed, because people who either don't have it or will be able to take the paracetamol and go to bed and be all right in a couple of days are terrified out of their wits. So, I mean, it's, I, I think myself that the government have handled this actually rather well. And uh, I, I, I represent the hotspot of swine flu in the whole country. Eight times the number of swine flu inquiries to the local GPs in my borough of Tower Hamlets in East End of London compared to Wales, for example. It's 790 people per 100,000, far and away the biggest. Now, why is that? For the same reason that the East End was hit hardest by the Spanish flu that Clive uh, referred to at the end of the First World War, I dare say even the Black Plague was the same. Because the people in the East End of London are poor, with underlying health problems, and living in overcrowded and often insanitary housing conditions. So it's hitting the poor hardest of all. And my advice to those who are not poor and don't have underlying health problems and don't feel like they're dying with this flu is to take that paracetamol and go to bed for a couple of days. <coughs> James Archer, please. James Archer. Does the panel agree with Alan Milburn that Britain's professions remain a closed shop? Alan Milburn's report uh, showing that the, the gap between people from poorer homes getting into professions has widened uh, since the 50s and that many of the professions remain a closed shop. He cited judges, 75% went to private school, finance directors, nearly half top civil servants, privately educated, uh, a third of MP. Okay. George Galloway. But there's more old Etonians on the Tory front bench today than there was in Alec Douglas Hume's government in the early 1960s. 
forgive me, forgive me, Saida, but the idea of the Conservatives as the party for social mobility is just, well, like, it's just laughable. Look, you can hear the people. George, you can, you, you can, you can hear let me finish his point. Right. You can hear the people laughing, and they're laughing all over the country as they watch this. The Tory party is the party of the richest and most successful and most powerful people in this country. It always was, and it always will be. No. No, the for God's great, sake, man, the, Margaret Thatcher was a grocer's daughter. The, 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 yes, what are you talking but, about? Well, never, let, let's talk about the current Tory front bench. Mm. Privately educated, Oxbridge educated, and mainly, or, or rather largely, Old Etonian. That's just a fact. Now, the great disaster is that 12, 13, 14 years of new Labour government has actually not, not only not narrowed that gap, but has actually widened it. The gap between rich and poor in Britain today is wider than it was when Charles Dickens wrote Oliver Twist. And that with, that with, that with record parliamentary majorities and the richest period in British economic history. It's an absolute disgrace. Jeff should hang his head in shame that Alan Milburns had to point out that social mobility in this country is going in the opposite direction. The Oxbridge takes eight times as many uh, pupils from private schools as it does from state schools. And the people who go to Oxbridge get the top jobs. Just check the BBC website and see. Can I come back? <laughs> uh, no, we'll just wait a moment. Uh, J uh, David, David Williams, please. How will we know when we've succeeded in Afghanistan? How will we know when we've succeeded in Afghanistan? Let's not have a, a, a too long a history lesson here. Let's just have an answer to that question. George Galloway. This war is doomed. It has never been the case that the Afghans have allowed any foreign armies to occupy their country. Alexander the Great failed. And uh, Captain Mannering, Bob Ainsworth, the new defence minister, ain't no Alexander the Great. Sooner or later, this war will have to come to a negotiated end. And it's better that it's sooner, given the rate of attrition of our own young men, not to mention the young men and women of Afghanistan. We, need, we have legitimate rights vis-a-vis -vis Afghanistan. We have a legitimate right that a pan-Islamist terrorist movement is not based there and does not strike us or our interests in the world. But we have no right and indeed no possibility of S uh, occupying Afghanistan, remaking it in some kind of parliamentary image, and certainly not with the raw material that we're operating with. We've exchanged one gang of warlords in Afghanistan for our own gang of warlords, who, if anything, are even worse in terms of governance than the people that we, but, but George, by force of arms, you, threw out. You say we have the right to, to prevent ourselves being attacked from there. What do you say to what the Foreign Office Minister, Lord Malik Brown, said, which was the main threat comes from Pakistan and Somalia, not Afghanistan? Well, that's exactly right. And, uh, the, so the, you mean the, we're in the wrong place? The invasion, we're fighting in the wrong the, place? The, the, the no, it's not that we're fighting in the wrong place. We're proliferating the kind of fanaticism which blew itself up on the London Underground and uh, in the Twin Towers of New York City. I, I warned this, if you'll forgive me saying so, at the time when, when the House was recalled four days after 9-11, uh, I said, if we handle this the wrong way, we'll make 10,000 new bin Ladens. Right. And that's exactly what we've done. All right. So Jeff better to, to get out of this trough before we're so deep into it that we can never get out of it. It was Saudi Arabia that 9-11 was launched from. 14 of the 19 hijackers on 9-11 came from Saudi Arabia but that Jeff Hoon sells weapons to. They were He goes out there to sell weapons to. They were in Saudi they Arabia. They were Saudi nationals. They were in Afghanistan. They, they, they mutated and, and their, their mindset was bred in Saudi Arabia and you were the biggest arms salesman to the very right. Saudi Arabia that spawned the, the these... At, um, at which point, I'm afraid to say, we have to stop because our hour's up. Apologies to those of you who are trying to get in on that. I'd just like to end by thanking all of you at home who have watched this programme over this season and have given us audiences larger than the history of Question Time has ever recorded. So thanks for watching us, and uh, I'm glad we've been of some use. Uh, from all of us here in Norwich, good night. <laughs>